Hey guys, Underwood here. This is uh, webcast number one for Honors Chemistry Unit 1. We're going to start talking about the historical background and the discovery of the particulate nature of the atom. First, let's go ahead and recap just a little bit. We have the atom here made of these three fundamental particles. Right here we have the electron, the proton, and the neutron. Let's talk a little bit about the electron real fast. It actually has a charge of negative one. And a mass that is so small that we don't even typically measure it relative to the other particles in the in the uh, atom. So we say that it's got a uh, mass of zero uh, atomic mass units. Uh, the electron resides in this area here, and that area is called the electron cloud. Some very important things you need to know about the electron cloud. Number one. It has a large volume, large volume as compared to the rest of the atom. But because those electrons are so small and of a limited number and, and uh, sort of odd in nature, we say that uh, it has a low density. So we could say that the electron cloud has a large volume, low density. Moving on, we could talk about the proton. The proton has the charge plus one. And its mass, relative to the rest of the particles in the atom, is uh, one atomic mass unit. The neutron has a charge that is neutral. The neutron is neutral, and it would say that we have an electric charge of zero. Mass there, again, one atomic mass unit need to know this information here. Now the neutron and the proton, they come together to form the nucleus. Some important information you need to know about the nucleus is that it is very small, but it holds most of the mass, most of the mass of the atom. But it's got low volume, low volume. So when we have a lot of mass in a small volume, we say that that is high dense. It's highly dense. It's got high density. All right. So just a little recap of some of the things we talked about in class. Moving on to how we discovered these uh, these properties. It took the uh, hard work of a number of uh, of scientists. We've got Democritus, Schrödinger, J.J. Thompson, Dalton, Rutherford, Bohr, Chadwick, Heisenberg, Millikan, and Einstein. I'm not going to make you memorize all this information about all these different characters, but we are going to concentrate on four of them. The first guy we're going to talk about, J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson was in charge of discovering the existence of a negative particle in the atom. That particle we later become known as the electron. Rutherford can be charged with uh, uh, discovering the existence of the nucleus. Millikan, discovering the charge of the electron. And Einstein, uh, studying the photoelectric effect and uh, finding out about the duality, the, duali the dual nature of light energy. And we're going to talk about what that means here in a little bit. First guy we talk about, J.J. Thompson. J.J. Thompson was going to Cambridge University, working there in 1897. And he was doing some work with cathode rays, cathode ray tubes. Now, cathode ray tube is a glass tube that is a vacuum means that all air has been evacuated okay the vacuum has a negative cathode and a positive anode and when an electric current is put between these two points the negative anode or sorry cathode ejects a beam of particles a beam of particles here we have a phosphorescent screen so when those particles strike that screen this glows, phosphorescence. All right. It's a phosphorescent screen. Now, what he, he wanted to find out about the behavior of this cathode ray, and so what he did was he used a capacitor. A capacitor is a is a contraption that is used to create a uniform electric field across a given plane. 
All right, we had the positive plate here, the negative plate here. When these two plates are attached to some sort of uh, electrical, uh, uh, electrical power source, then it creates a magnet or uh, electric field. Uh, what happened to that beam when that electric field was put in place is that the beam itself started to bend towards the positive plate. Now let's recap a little bit. We know that opposites attract. So if I have something that has a positive charge and we put it with something else that has a positive charge, or if we have something that has a negative charge and we put it with something else that has a negative charge, we're going to get repulsion. Repulsion. So it should push away. Okay? But if we have something that has a positive charge and then we put it with something that has a negative charge, those things will be attracted to one another. So as you can see, this beam, normally going in a very linear fashion, is now influenced by the electric field being bent towards the positive plate. And if it's being bent towards the positive plate, that means it must be negative in nature. And so what he concluded from these ex experiments was that these cathode rays were comprised of negatively charged particles. He called those corpuscles. Uh, we would later call them electrons. Uh, on top of that, he also formulated this idea called the plum pudding model. So we're going to talk about that just a little bit right now. Plum pudding model. Now before Thompson came onto the scene, it was seen that the atom was this glob of positive stuff. Positively charged stuff. But with his experiments, he realized that now there's this negative charge. This negative charge. And what he deduced or what he decided was that this negative charge was distributed evenly throughout this positively charged material. So his model for the atom looks something like this. Uh, a positive hunk of pudding with little pieces of plum, the plum pudding model, right? We've got the positive pudding and the negatively charged plum, a.k.a electrons. Now we know now that this is not a uh, accurate depiction of what an atom looks like but you had to start somewhere. Moving on we can start talking about Ernest Rutherford and his discovery of the nucleus. Now Ernest Rutherford was working at Victoria University in Manchester in 1909 and he was working with uh, materials that were radioactive and so he was a, a expert uh, in the day of, of radio in, 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 the, in the science of radioactivity alright now he used an alpha particle emitter an alpha particle emitter now let's talk about alpha particles for a second alpha particles alpha particles are actually helium nuclei and a helium nucleus is made up of two positive protons and then it's also made of two neutral neutrons. So it's a helium atom that has had the electrons stripped away completely. Now, if you look at this, if we've got two positive protons and two neutral charges, then we would say that the overall charge of this particle is positive in nature, right? So he had this alpha particle emitter, this material that was emitting these alpha particles, radiating these alpha particles. He took this material, he put it be behind a uh, lead enclosure. So this right here is a lead enclosure. Why do you use lead? Well, have you ever gone to the dentist and gotten an x-ray? They drape you in lead. They drape you lead because x-rays are a certain type of radiation. And they don't want those x-rays to enter your body anywhere where they might do damage. And so they only point that x-ray right where they need it, right at the fracture or the bone or whatever they're taking a picture of. They point it right there. They cover the rest of you in lead because lead, as you know, is impervious to many types of radiation. So inside this lead cube, it's a cube here in this picture, he poked a hole. And he poked a hole right here. And that hole allowed some of those alpha particles to be emitted as a beam. And the beam was... Uh, aimed at a thin slice of gold foil. That sl thin slice of gold foil only made of gold atoms. 
So here's what happened. The alpha particles were shot at the old foil, and using this detecting screen here, the detecting screen, he was able to see where those different alpha particles ended up. And this is what he found out. If we look at a, a, uh, a little microscopic version, we can see our gold atoms. These guys are our gold atoms. And these yellow beams here, those are our alpha particles. So the alpha particles were shot at the gold foil. And what he found out was that a little bit greater than 98% of the alpha particles traveled right through the foil, zing, right on through, straight line. Now this, the conclusion he drew from this was that atoms are mostly empty space. And we've learned in class that yes, atoms are mostly empty space. Most of the volume of the atom is found in that electron cloud. And that electron cloud is not very dense at all. So we would say that atoms are mostly empty space. But what interested him the most was that little less than 2% of those alpha particles were actually deflected in different directions. Sometimes they would go to the right, sometimes they would go to the left, sometimes they would shoot right back at the origin. So what was he able to deduce from this? Well, let's recap. Remember, the alpha particles have a charge that is roughly positive, right? Positive in nature. Now, if those... If those uh, if whatever particle that, that those alpha particles were deflecting off, if they were negative, then the positive and the negative, they would stick together, and we wouldn't see those alpha particles travel through the foil. So we know that the, whatever particle that is deflecting those alpha particles, it can't be negative. It must be positive. And because it only happened less than 2% of the time, then we know that that particle is extremely small, and that's the truth. In the center of an atom, we have the nucleus. The nucleus is positive in charge because it's made of positive protons and neutral neutrons. But it's also pretty small. Although it's got a lot of mass, it's very small in size. And so we would know that those alpha particles wouldn't hit the, nu the nucleus very often. It would only hit it from time to time. And so his conclusions from this data were that there is a positively, ch positively charged center to the atom and it's very massive, but it is very small. And so that massive center, we would come to call the nucleus. So we could say that Rutherford, he picked up some very exciting evidence as to the existence of the nucleus.